crunching data. That's the key to really understanding how governments work. Digging out unique narratives, then telling the story. And putting a voice to all that data? Well, that's the job of the monthly with Senator Pamela Wallen. Today on The Monthly, our series on rebuilding the Canadian economy in the post-COVID era continues with a look at universal basic income or guaranteed annual income. Whatever the name, it is an idea that has been touted by all on the political spectrum at one time or another and debated in this country for more than 60 years. This week, people in Canada are actually taking to the streets to say, the time has finally come. And one of those people will be the Honorable Hugh Siegel, former Senator who for decades has been making the case that this is the way to deal with poverty in Canada. Welcome, I'm Pamela Wallen, your moderator for today. But before we begin, let me bring in your host today, Greg McDougall of Government Analytics to help set the stage. Greg? Thank you, Senator. And thank you, uh, Hugh, for joining us. This is a, a real pleasure, and 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 uh, we're really uh, really excited to have someone of such stature. And and it, it's our what we've been always trying to do is blend that economic analysis and, and data crunching that we do with with policy wonks. And I couldn't think of a better policy wonk in the country than you, sir. So again, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Okay, Greg, that's great. So let's begin. On your invitation, you have a bio of our guest today. A uh, lifelong progressive conservative. We're referencing his latest book, Bootstraps Need Boots. Um, but I also want to uh, remind people that he wrote a book entitled Two Freedoms, in which he talked about the most fundamental freedoms are freedom from want and freedom from fear. And I think that's at the core of uh, what we're talking about today in his lifelong fight to end poverty. Senator Siegel, Mr. Siegel, Hugh, welcome. Good to see you. Great to be here, Pam. All right, I was uh, doing, you know, you and I've been on about this issue for a very long time. I first uh, read Daniel Pot Patrick Monaghan on GAI when I was in university. Um, but I found a great comment the other day from a professor who called uh, UBI or Guaranteed Annual Income, the Swiss army knife of poverty and quality of life policy because it just has so many um, uh, aspects to it. So you actually were a little bit more elegant in your language that you call this vital infrastructure, the infrastructure of civility and opportunity. Make your case. Well, um, my case is very simple. Um, we have for decades been running provincial welfare programs across Canada, which are not doing the job in the sense that a no provincial welfare payment to anybody in need is, is, is any higher than half the poverty rate in that province. It's a little bit better in Newfoundland than Labrador, but generally speaking. So that means if you're a single individual uh, in poverty living in, let us say, downtown Toronto, you're going to get $700 a month. Plus, you're going to get a series of bureaucratic regulations that say if you want to go out and earn a little bit of money on the side for your family, you can't. We're going to punish you. The province will claw back that $700 dollar for dollar for any money you make working. So a program that doesn't reduce poverty, that traps people in poverty and discourages work, strikes me as the most um, unrealistic and un-Canadian way of dealing with the problem. The, the goal should be first of all, to bridge people out of poverty as quickly as possible. Secondly, to make sure that if they are in poverty, either because of um, a handicap of some sort, or because they grew up in a poor family and had no opportunities, uh, or because they may be part of the uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color population who are disproportionately represented amongst the poor. Um, if you um, if you want to give them a chance up, you've got to give them the basic amount necessary to meet their basic, basic uh, expenses, which is why the program is called basic income by many proponents. 
And you know, the old notion of, well, you know, if you, as people on the right say, if you pay people who aren't working, why would they ever work? Well, that ignores the fact that over 60% of the people who live in poverty in Canada have a job. Some have more than one. They just can't in a city like Toronto or Calgary or Vancouver earn enough from those two or three part-time jobs to actually get above the poverty line. The other thing that I think is really, really important to understand in terms of social determinants of health is the relationship between poverty and early illness and early death and a whole bunch of pathologies that come with poverty. If you walk into the emergency ward in the non-COVID period of any major hospital in any, any, any major city, the vast majority of people sitting in the waiting room come from the low income part of the population. They don't have a doctor, right. nowhere else to go. And whatever they're there for, if it's not traumatic, if they're there for some heart trouble or some problems related to diabetes or whatever, they are there because the conditions under which they live makes their circumstance worse and makes it worse faster. And we know that the demographic pressures on our healthcare system just because of the aging population yeah. means that the system's under great pressure anyway. So, um, you know, uh, as a colleague once said, we have to start investing upstream to reduce the level of poverty, which will reduce the amount of people who get sick earlier in life and end up needing hospital care more extensively early on. All right, I wanna get into some of the mechanics of this and, and because there are different delivery systems and uh, yep. different objectives, but just a quick review of some of the history because on the face of it, it seems like kind of an obvious idea and we've been through the world of CERB now, which uh, may change the mindset. But back in the 1930s, Premier Eberhardt in Alberta tried to do this. He called it a social credit, of course, as we will remember. Um, C.D. Howe in 1945 talked about standard of living. We Today we call it affordability and all of those things or quality of life. Uh, David Kroll, Senate uh, special report in 1971 calling for this. The experiment in Manitoba called Mincom in 1974. What is the fundamental resistance? The resistance comes from uh, three sources who are well provisioned. Uh, source number one, pretty well anybody who works in any finance department anywhere in the world sees their job as preserving the spending discretion of their minister and government. Every statutory program that says, as long as people meet certain conditions, there's going to be an automatic payout reduces the level of discretionary income with which public servants have to negotiate. So generally speaking, they oppose that. By the way, for the same reason, they tend to oppose large naval procurements because so much capital is caught, is caught up for so long. Right. So that's part of it. And that's, that's a serious part because they consistently will tell their ministers, we can't afford this and we don't want to do it. And it's not our jurisdiction. So that's one group. The other group, and this is interesting, are some of the public sector unions. And here's their view. So we have thousands of welfare caseworkers now employed by the provinces and municipalities across Canada. Because of how bureaucratic welfare is, you know, um, you have to apply for welfare, you may have to see a caseworker, you have to prove that you're poor, you may have to get rid of some assets you have because you're not eligible if you happen to own a house or if you happen to own a car, they may force you to sell some of those assets. Anyway, uh, those people who as far as I know are hardworking, good public servants doing their job as best they can, their union worries that, well, if we have this automatic payout to people who fell beneath the poverty line, then over time, a lot of those jobs would disappear. And my answer to that is, yep, they would. They're yeah. not going to disappear now or in the next 20 years. Those people will be re, uh, re redeployed for other important activities. But over time, the automatic flow of cash will reduce some of that excessive bureaucratic proposition. And the other group who are really opposed are what I would call my friends on the far right, who see it simply as an expansion of the role of the state, and they see it as spending money we can't afford. The numbers don't back them up, 
but the theology keeps them going. And so those three groups pretty well operate, not necessarily in cooperation with each other, but as a, as a, as a way of keeping this progress from taking place. One of the things that um, <clears throat> I found interesting, it's part of the reason we're doing this here today is because just a few weeks before uh, budget 2021 was finally tabled, that <laughs> took a couple of years, uh, Finance Canada with no kind of releases or fanfare or anything, posted a quality of life strategy on its website. Um, kind of a reflection of things we've heard from Judith Maxwell, a great Canadian economist over the years, and she's been dealing with this. But it, it, it's almost like, you know, getting in under the radar. And I guess maybe they were looking for something in the long run to justify the cost of CERB, but also to maybe capitalize on the change of mindset that CERB may have created, both good and bad. <laughs> Yeah, Pam, I, I, first of all, I give the finance officials credit for having done that. Mm -hmm. Putting something into the debate is always very constructive, and, uh, and that's very much something that is constructive. Secondly, let me say this. I think what we have discovered during the pandemic is that there are some serious holes in our system, which are bad for people's health and longevity, but also horrifically bad for the economy. So, for example, if you do a heat map of any of the major cities in Canada, of where the pandemic hit the hardest, where the casualties were the highest, where the fatality rate was most oppressive, that heat map doesn't take you to places like Rosedale or Forest Hill or Point Grey or Westmount. It takes you to the poor end of town, pretty consistently, number one. Number two, Many of the people who work in our um, in homes for the aged across the country were part-time employees, not paid very much, had no benefits. And then because they could not withdraw from work uh, because they couldn't afford to, they ended up being innocent purveyors of the virus in the different places they were working to try to make enough money to live. So you ask yourself this question, if we had invested in a basic income structure, which by the way, we have several in the country at the national level now, which I'll talk about, think about how many of those people would not have been infected. How many of those people would not have spread the virus from seniors home to seniors home, you know, resulting in a fatality rate that should embarrass every Canadian forever. It was right. so, so it's it's the it's the notion of asking this question. Is basic income as a amendment to our economic and social infrastructure, a massive investment of new cash is an expenditure we'll never recover, or are there real returns on investment that are measurable and become constructive in the population? I'll give you a very real example. Um, I remember when I was a junior on Mr. Davis's staff in the 1970s, it was a minority government. And uh, at a committee meeting, uh, the NDP and the Liberals passed a motion to reduce the salary of the then Minister of Social Policy, the Honorable Margaret Birch, the first woman ever appointed to a cabinet in Ontario's history, and her deputy, Doug Wright, to a dollar, because they had done nothing to deal with seniors' poverty. Um, we had just been through an election campaign. Seniors' poverty didn't come up. Rent control came up. Other issues came up, but it didn't. I remember the deputy, uh, who's no longer with us, sadly, came to see me. I was a junior legislative assistant in the premier's office, and he said, Hugh, they've reduced my salary to a dollar. I said, well, hang on. It's a motion. It has to pass the House, so it's not real. Yet. <laughs> well, why don't we find out what it's all about? Because it hasn't been part of the public debate. So that produced a report done by the Department of Treasury, Economics, and Intergovernmental Affairs. Darcy McHugh is the minister, a very right-wing conservative minister. And that report came back to cabinet and said, if you're a woman and, over, and if you're 65 living in Ontario, then 35% of you are living beneath the poverty line. That stunned the cabinet. The cabinet had no idea. And I thought that, you know, there was always a right and a center right and a more progressive side of every conservative cabinet. I thought there'd be a shootout and nothing would happen. But then Darcy McHugh, God love him, leaned into the table and said, Premier, 
These are the women who were there to get us through the depression. These are the women who were there waiting for the boys to come home from war. They're not going to be poor in my Ontario, period, full stop. Let's get this done. And within the year, the guaranteed annual income supplement for seniors was passed and it was automatic. In other words, if you filed your taxes and your Ontario, and the Ontario portion of your federal form said your income was beneath a certain level, you were automatically taught. And the level of poverty went from 35% to under 5% in two years. And longevity numbers started to go up. People were going to live longer. They had better food. They were living in better places. All of which indicated, by the way, that's where the whole industry of building apartments and things for seniors right. emerged because they were going to live long enough to make it a worthwhile investment. So that shows you there's a real return when you do yeah. things. And furthermore, Hugh, your story and then the story of the CERB, which is uh, when there's political will, when there's motivation, usually from a political crisis or in this time a pandemic, which was in part a political crisis, the bureaucracy can move. We got CERB money out really, really quickly to people all across the country, maybe to some people who didn't need it. Um, there's some evidence that it has been a bit of a disincentive to go back to work if you hear from the small businesses uh, that they're having a hard time. But this system is doable. It's not like, oh my God, we can't deliver a program on a national basis. Well, I mean, and we know how to do it. I mean, look, one morning in the, in, I guess in March or thereabouts, eight and a half million Canadians who had a job the previous week woke up without a job because public health advisories had shut down a whole bunch of businesses. And, and um, the government, to its credit, took a look at unemployment insurance as it existed, employment insurance, looked at provincial welfare and determined none of those can actually respond quickly enough or with sufficient liquidity to solve this problem. And I know of people here in Kingston, where we have a lot of students and a lot of people who work in the, in the restaurant trade, um, they filed on Monday and the money was in their bank account by Wednesday. So there, is, it's, there is no federal program or provincial yeah. program that can be that adept at dealing with the problem. And when I say to my American friends who were suffering with these long lineups of cars at university at football fields to go to food banks, they say, oh, how come you didn't have any of that in Canada? I said, well, because we had the CERB. Yeah. There was no one put into that situation. And I give the government of the day full credit. So the, the other side of CERB, which is we're starting to see now because the Bank of Canada stepped in and backed all the government debt, both provincial and federal, to unprecedented levels of numbers. And then this week we saw um, what many predicted would be the inevitable inflation. Um, cost of gasoline up 32%, traveling 19%, house payments 15%. Um, meat, 7%, vehicles, 7%. Like there are consequences when governments spend and spend in that way. But I guess part of your argument is we don't need to spend to that degree. Well, moreover, um, roughly, depending on how you count, 10% of Canadians uh, live beneath the poverty line. So that's three and a half million people. The number is a little higher in the rural areas. And of course, amongst our First Nations brothers and sisters, the number is at 30%, which is a third world number just for another discussion yeah. someday. Yeah, we'll get to it. But the notion that you top up that 10% so that they're not living in abject poverty would itself be inflationary, I think makes no sense at all. And, and let's be clear that when low income people get more money, they don't open up um, tax free accounts in the Barbados and they do not by uh, condominiums in Portugal to avoid taxes. They spend it on food and they spend it on rent and they spend it on clothes for their kids, all of which is actually good for the economy and good for the community. Let's, let's look at the costs here because there's, again, there's a couple of issues. We spend, and the number may be higher now, but something like $180 billion a year on transfers, uh, not counting health and education. Correct. And those are two giant uh, ticket items. So these are all kinds of programs to help kids or to help the elderly or help women or to help, you know, people with disability, to help Indigenous uh, 
can can you give us some number that I mean would it be less than that would it be greater than that what are we looking at so this question has been put by various MPs both those who like the idea of the program and those who hate it uh, to the parliamentary budget officer and he has been very diligent in answering it in great detail and essentially his response says as follows the gross expenditure at the outset for a program like this, which would say to the three and a half million Canadians you're gonna to get topped up to the poverty line or a bit more, would roughly cost somewhere in the area of 60 to $70 billion gross a year. Now, what that does not count is, remember, every taxpayer pays both provincial and federal tax. We spend about 30 billion a year on welfare in the provinces. That would be obviated by this program coming out of the national operation. So that would already get that number down to about 30 billion um, before you begin to add up the net benefits of better health, uh, better association with work. Because for example, in the pilot that was done in Ontario, which I had some role, yep. the plan was you would get 1300 a month, rising it up from 650 and if you earned anything, which you were welcome to do, you'd pay 50% of that back in tax. And then if you actually earned as much as the grant, then you'd pay the same level of taxation on all of it as the rest of us do when we go to work every day. Yeah. So that would have been a program that was at some measure self-financing and actually would have produced economic growth and growth in GDP, which also produces net benefits to the treasury. So um, the notion that you just look at one side of the ledger to say, here's what it's going to cost without looking at the other side, or what is the benefit? And what is the cost of doing nothing as we speak? You know, at, um, at St. Mike's, um, they had uh, what I like to refer to as the $1,007 bowl of soup. And, you know, uh, they have a very street sensitive program at, at, at St. Mike's for emergency and other requirements and people wander in, they have some chronic issue. It's apparent they're a little bit back on their upper, so to speak. So they put in a policy that said that after you triage the patient, figure out what their problem is, give them advice or connect them with a specialist or give them some pharmaceutical prescriptions. Do not let them leave without a sandwich and a bowl of soup. So you think about that, the cost of that per patient is $1,007, a thousand, for the per capita cost of all the medical triage being done and seven bucks for the bowl of soup and the sandwich. Think how much we would start to save if they didn't show up in that condition to begin with because they had enough money to eat and live reasonably properly, not well, but properly before they got sick. All right, let's, I wanna look at some of the mechanisms and, and also this idea because it's not just union members in the welfare system that don't want to give up their jobs. There are a lot of people who believe uh, a universal income or a guaranteed income is kind of a Trojan horse that, a, you know, you're going to put it out there and then you're going to get rid of all these social programs uh, underneath it, which in a sense you are, but it's not there to undermine healthcare or education or a pension plan those things remain. It's just the, the panoply of other programs that would go. Right. The focus of those of us now who are advancing basic income, and there's a group across the country, Basic Income Canada Network, who've been doing this in every constituency and asking questions to every candidate, parliament for every, every party. Um, the premise is, is, is really as follows. This is about how you transfer cash to poor people. This is not about special programs for the handicapped or special programs for the learning impaired or special programs for uh, folks who live in a certain part of the country and have special costs that others don't have. None of those would be touched. This is just about dealing about that way in which as a society, we provide liquidity to low income people who need it to live. And when you started earlier on in the discussion about uh, the federal government and the Bank of Canada and in making interest rates so low and creating so much money in the system that have kept our corporations and our banks liquid during a difficult time as they did in 07, 08. 
I don't have any particular problem for that with that. I just ask this question. If we're doing it for the big guys, because it's important for the structure of the economy, what about liquidity for the little guys? We're going through just as difficult a point of view and the amount of money that would cost wouldn't even show up on the Richter scale by comparison to what we're doing for the big, big, big guys. Let's talk about mechanism because uh, I think you are and most people are of the view that this should be dealt with through a negative in income tax uh, system versus a check in the mail. Correct. So the, the best way to do this in my judgment, and we should pick up some of the some of what we learned from CERB is that you file your taxes, you put your income on the line, yeah. and that income either makes you eligible for an automatic top up or not. And on that form, you'd indicate whether you want the top up monthly, quarterly, annually, and, and there'd be a bias in favor of monthly because it's better in terms of planning one spending. Right. Now, um, that would be a way of ensuring, A, if you lie on your tax form, it's a serious offense. So it's, this is not about gaming the system. You got to tell the truth. <clears throat> and secondly- More serious consequences than welfare fraud, for example. And CRA has clearly demonstrated its ability to put money in people's bank accounts quickly. The other thing we learned from CERB, because one of the legitimate criticisms was, well, you know, not everybody spends a whole year being poor. They may be doing okay. Then they lose their job or then they have a health problem then they fall into poverty. Do they have to wait until April until they file? Well, what we've now learned from CERB is no, you can now file online and you can do it right away. And the money can then be put in your bank account very quickly. So that agility for which I give our, our the men and women working at CRA great credit makes the ability to do this on a timely and efficient way much more appropriate and apparent than was the case before. And Presumably, I mean, if you're the wealthy living in, uh, uh, you know, as you say, Point Grey or Rosedale, uh, this this won't apply. Your income will be too high. It'll be taxed back. That, well, so it's important to think about that because there you're talking about what is now another option. One of the options of proponents of this is to say, no, actually, you give everybody a thousand dollars a month, rich, poor, or medium, and then. For those who are doing better, well, Her Majesty will tax that back in April, and the others will get to keep more. So I don't actually believe in the efficiency of our Revenue Canada collection system that much. And you and I know that we all know people who are reasonably well off. They get tax advice as to how to maximize what they earn and keep and minimize what they pay. It is far better to do the automatic top up where those in need get the top up. And those who are above a certain line simply aren't eligible. The regional differences, the urban versus rural, uh, if there's just this base amount that we say will keep people, keep their heads above water. I mean, we're not talking about taking, uh, you know, Bahamian vacations. We're just talking about putting food on the table here. Um, it's going to be different if you live in the urban core or if you live in a small town or in the country where you might be able to have a garden or, you know, I don't want to get too granular here, but there will be differences. How do you account for that? How does that get worked into well, the system? The, the, the good thing is, is that about four or five years ago, the federal government stopped using something called LICO or the low income cutoff, which was that kind of national number that you're making reference to, which would be, um, would be regionally insensitive to the market basket test. And the market basket test basically says, if you're living in Northern Ontario, here's what the basic amount of money is you will need for some rent, some food, some clothes, some public transportation, if there isn't. That's the base. So that's the basis upon which this particular payout would be designed. So the number would be different if you're living, if you're a poor person living in <clears throat> downtown Vancouver versus if you're a low income person uh, living in Northern Saskatchewan where you have another range of costs and issues and a system is completely set up to do that comfortably now. It would not be a large bureaucratic design issue. And because the market basket test is now being used 
by Ottawa to assess the level of poverty across um, Canada, it's in place and can be easily deployed. So that j just to reinforce that notion, I mean, if you're in in uh, downtown Toronto, you can get to work or to other places where you might be earning some income on the side on the subway. If you're in rural Saskatchewan, you're going to need a car and then you're going to pay the carbon tax on your gas and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to balance that. I remember when the Senate committee that Art Eggleton chaired and I served yep. going yep. through this issue of urban poverty. And we had a very thoughtful um, academic uh, from, uh, from a university uh, in North Bay who made the proposal for the market basket test as a better test. But one of the things he had in his proposal was, you know, there's a number that will tell you what it costs to live in Northern uh, Ontario, food, rent, public transit. I put up my hand and I said, I wonder, I wonder Mr. Chairman, if I could ask our distinguished guest what he knows about public transit in Northern Ontario. <laughs> there is no public transit in Northern Ontario or in most rural parts of Canada now, now that Greyhound and others are gone. So you actually have to work in some cost around maintaining some kind of mobility, which perhaps you share with other people so you can get around. So that's just one of those calculations which will be important to making this accurate and fair. But doable. Absolutely. The other the other big ticket items uh, item that I want to have you address is the the transfers to the indigenous communities on in so many different ways. Um, and yes, we've got huge problems with the Indian Act and all of those things. They have to be uh, addressed more formally. But there's an awful lot of support and it has ballooned that goes out the door and no tax paid in exchange. How do you see that being an answer to that issue, to the, to the basic income? Well, when we were designing the, um, the pilot in Ontario, yep. part of our direction from the finance minister was to make sure that we reflected both the principles of reconciliation and uh, First Nations sovereignty in working with the First Nations about how the pilot would operate. And you actually have two issues there. Issue number one is that um, for many of our First Nations who live um, on in First Nations communities, the money that comes for that community comes directly from the Indian Act to their governing council uh, in that jurisdiction. Right. So there's not very much that goes directly to the individual who may be living in poverty. Now, many of the councils do a great job in being helpful to the members of their community. I'm not being critical of that. So part of the debate that we would have to have constructively and collaboratively with our First Nations brothers and sisters was, if every Canadian who falls beneath the poverty line is going to be eligible for a top-up, what is the rationale for First Nations members who fall beneath the poverty line not being eligible for a top up that goes to them, not to their, not to their band council, right. but to them as individuals. And I would argue that that would give First Nations individuals more standing in their community. They have more resources that they need and would make it perfectly clear that the band council reports to them and not the other way around. And which is what happens to the rest of us wherever we live in the country. So that would have to be designed carefully with First Nations, but I can't think of any legitimate case that could be made to say we would do this for the entire country and leave First Nations out because of the Indian Act. Make no sense at all. So, so include that, and then that would, of course, assume paying taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, at some level. And point yeah. is, the point is that you, you the, 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 the important priority of keeping their identity, maintaining their uh, self-governance, um, autonomy, uh, working on a nation-to-nation -nation basis is has to be preserved through this. On the other hand, the notion that low-income First Nations deserve the same level of support as low-income uh, non-First Nation Canadians, I think, is a pretty compelling principle. So the other programs, just let's, uh, I just want to make sure that we're, we're on the same, the, the Canada Child Benefit would stay? Yes. Oh, yes, it would. And um, for people who are getting that Canada Child Benefit, who are largely middle and lower income, and they're getting so much per child per year, they might, not all of them will be eligible because their income level may be a little right. too. 
which is fine. Um, the, um, the, um, the, one of the things that would go would be the HST tax credit. I remember when, it, when the HST was introduced in the tax credit and I was teaching at Queens, I'd say to my graduate students in April, I hope you're planning to file your taxes. And they'd say, well, we don't have any money, professor. Why would we be doing that? So because if you're earning back then less than $30,000 a year, the HST low income tax credit will put an automatic deposit in your account. So you're not paying too much of your minimal income on, on HST. So that would be a program we could do away with because this other program would cover that, uh, that, 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 that exposure and do it in a more efficient way. And pension plans, including government funded and contributor funded pension plans. They would stay untouched by any of this. Because in the end, when you file a tax form to say, this is my name, this is my social insurance number, this is what I do for a living, this is how much I earn, you have to include all those other incomes uh, because you get T4 slips and T5 slips from them to include with your form. And if you don't do that, then you're violating the tax act. And then uh, OAS, um, old age, that's a supplement program. The supplement program, but it's still, when you file your taxes, you have to declare every source of income uh, so Her Majesty knows what your actual tax bracket is, which determines how much tax you pay. One of the things that um, I guess we also learned through, uh, the, through the CERB program and the programs that were needed is um, the level, I guess, not only of indebtedness of many, many households across this country, but as you have cited earlier, the level of poverty, the number of people who needed that and who need these other programs. It, the, the, the bigger question is you have spent your life fighting for to end poverty. It, it's, it's pretty difficult to imagine that we're going to bring that to an end, regardless of the delivery mechanism of programs to help people up. So if, 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 you're, if you're asking Pam whether or not the introduction of this program, probably on a phased basis across the country, yeah. would reduce poverty to zero, the answer is unlikely. But if we can get poverty in various parts of the country down from 10 or 15% to closer to two or 3%, we're having a huge impact on the quality of life, the life expectancy, and the prospects for the children of literally millions of Canadians. And I can't imagine why a rational market-driven country would not seek to do that because other market-driven countries, um, by the way, I mean, there's this general framework that says, you know, we spend so much on social policy and health is so expensive and can we afford it? And that's a natural, but when you take a look at public expenditure in, in, in our competitor countries on social and health care, Actually, Canada is pretty well the last amongst a group that includes the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Germany, France, Belgium, Austria, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark. They all spend more, yet they're all pretty productive and pretty technologically advanced societies. Yeah. So I think we have talked ourselves into believing that we're spending more than we are, and we're not really addressing what happens when you're on the bottom of that list in terms of competitive forces, which are important. Yeah. This is many of your viewers as odd, but we actually face labor shortages. Yeah. Some of which you've referenced uh, because of some of the implications of people not getting paid very much. But when you have a social program that tells people they can't work, you are diminishing the labor force at a time when we need more people in the labor force. Yeah. And basic income doesn't discourage you from working. Yeah, no, if you're going to punish people for earning money, then of course they're, they're, they're not going to work. Is there any international example of this? I know everybody like us uh, has studied this issue uh, endlessly. Is it working anywhere? So interestingly enough, there are now nine big American cities who have undertaken to do basic income pilots in their own jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, several cities like Stockton, California, that have been doing this for a couple of years. And they're sending $500 to low income people in their community. And the impact in terms of employment, 
in terms of the crime rate going down, in terms of kids going to school, has been measurable and substantive. And uh, the same thing has happened in places like Finland and in, uh, in Scotland uh, and in the Netherlands. And um, in Spain now, they have a government that's a mix of social Democrats and others. They're now bringing in a basic income as part of their overall structural process. And Spain is actually a pretty competitive country in terms of various things it produces and sells and exports around the world. So I think it's coming. Uh, the largest province of South Korea, which is itself a very economically vibrant and competitive place, has been doing this for low-income people beneath a certain age for two years, and the results have been fantastic. So, Just, sorry, go ahead. So there are more and more examples of people who are doing this, and I would like Canada not to be the last one on that train. The the Manitoba experiment, the Mincom experiment, found some counterintuitive facts. It did not discourage people from working. Um, it did help women. What, what went wrong there? Well, the experiment was stopped, as often happens, because there was an election in which Mr. Schreiber yeah. was defeated. Sterling Lyon became the premier. Uh, the other partner in that was Pierre Trudeau, mm -hmm. and his government was defeated in 79, and Mr. Clark came in. And generally speaking, governments of a different affiliation don't embrace the new ideas of the right. On principle. <laughs> but, but one of the interesting things about, about that was the measured derivative benefits in financial terms that the folks who studied the results have found. So for example, during the period of the MinCom experiment in Dauphin and a few other parts of Manitoba, the expenditure of the Manitoba uh, Health Insurance Program, which is like OHIP and the rest, actually went down by eight and a half percent a year. During the operation of that program, there were less arrests, there were less car accidents. Uh, the kids were showing up at school at a higher level. And as you pointed out, none of the recipients used the basic income guarantee as a reason not to work. This was, a, you know, it was a, a, a farming town, um, uh, people who believed in work, but the fact that they knew that there was this backstop in the event there was a problem was of great, great impact and particularly helpful uh, to women uh, who before the introduction of the program uh, would often not be able to stay home with their infants you know, a couple of months or three months as might be deemed to be appropriate, whatever your view might be. And now with this, they could. And the other group, interestingly enough, who did not go to work quite as much was a group referred to by StatsCan as unattached young males, euphemism for high school students who could now finish high school when their family had financial problems rather than leave school and go find a job because there wasn't enough money that's on the table. And by the way, imagine the benefit in 1975 to a young man who got to finish high school yeah. when many of his friends were not able to in terms of what he would produce, pay tax, and contribute to society for the rest of his life. No, no, life changing. I just, uh, a final um, comment today, and then I'll ask Greg and others to come in. But we went into this campaign. Um, in the midst of a pandemic. And there's certainly been lots of discussion about whether that was a good idea or not. Uh, but everybody assumed that affordability would be a question. We had this extreme spending, of course, uh, for justifiable reasons on many accounts, but it, it then became kind of cover for let's just, let's just spend more. Um, at the same time, we, it, it did highlight some of the the need in this country and the levels of poverty that still exist. Yet here we are in the final hours and affordability hasn't been front and center. We've been talking about who's a bad guy and who's a good guy when it comes to the pandemic. Like, that's it. Well, and look, that's a kind of the, the question you ask is spot on, but it, there's a series of complex contributing factors to that. Um, we had three or four TV debates two in English, one, two in French, rather, one in English. Yep. And I don't recall anybody asking any questions about affordability. I know. 
These are your colleagues, your fellow journalists, by the way. Just the former. <laughs> number one. And, and number two, um, there really hasn't been much discussion about poverty. Yeah. Uh, to their credit, the Green Party has been on this issue for 10 years and they've stayed consistent with that. The NDP sort of pretends maybe they're almost interested, but they're never actually all that certain. Um, but nevertheless, they've been there, uh, but the other parties have not. And, uh, and that's too bad because that would have been a really worthwhile debate for the country to participate in because the numbers are clear. The numbers are that 70% of Canadians think this would be a good thing. And they'd like to see it discussed and they would see it as an efficient improvement over an overly bureaucratic, not yep. efficient and unproductive present welfare system. Incredible. Hugh, thank you. I, I'm just going to see if, if Greg or anyone else wants to jump in at this point. Uh, but uh, it, thank you for your insights on this, because you have dedicated years, decades to this issue. So if you not, read any not, one of, go ahead. When I began this battle, I had hair. Just so <laughs> Oh my God, that was really a long time ago. Really a long time ago. Being invited Greg. to the be invited to pass comment when no one has, between the two of us can't rub our hairs together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Any Senator, final uh, thoughts, Greg? Well, uh, yeah, and I can't I can't stop from saying Senator Siegel, so I'll continue on. So yes, we'll just thank, do it. Thank yeah. you for that. But can you can you talk a little bit because you were just getting at it there um, for a couple of seconds? Outcomes on the existing welfare system. You've, you've studied it extensively. Um, one of your 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 uh, points you were making is what you're what you're proposing would be just far more efficient in terms of outcomes. What's the comparison there? So here's the comparison. The comparison is um, existing welfare recipients who go through a pretty substantive uh, bureaucratic process to be eligible have to prove they're poor, by the way, on an ongoing basis. Uh, does not does this does not lift them out of poverty. It does not bridge them to work. And so therefore you begin to get a permanent underclass who are problematic for any society because it's intrinsically unfair. And that's when you get the pathologies of substance abuse, uh, other kinds of abuse. Uh, uh, you know, when we had the police before our Senate committee and said to them, how does poverty manifest itself in your work? Yeah. And the police from Vancouver and Montreal and Toronto said, well, actually, we, um, we aren't very busy in Point Grey. And we're not very busy in Forest Hill, uh, but we are busy in the other parts of town. And we think poverty is a huge contributor to that. So um, if you had the basic income approach, A, you would be reducing the amount of low income people who weren't working. You'd be increasing the amount of people in the workforce because it would be in their interest to be in the workforce and have this top up and the level of tax they would pay would not be so prohibitive as to make it silly for them to work. Quite the contrary, there'd be an incentive to work. And what you hope is that when they get this basic proposition and they earn, and at some point they earn more than what would make them eligible for the basic grant, they would continue in the workforce and they would have bridged out of poverty in a way which is productive for Canada and really much better for their quality of life. So those are the two kinds of outcomes we now face. Okay. So now I, I want to just uh, take a moment then to put you on the spot, because if you, if you look east in Atlantic Canada, we have a new premier in, uh, in Newfoundland who's effectively managing himself through uh, a government that is effectively bankrupt. And, and they've had a, uh, a damn, uh, damn green has reported on how, how uh, difficult the situation is there. You also have a premier in Nova Scotia who's committed to working on the determinants of health to try and turn around the public health system there, which was the, the primary reason he got elected. So my question to you is then, how would you go about, the, the, the word that comes to mind is sales, like how would you argue to them that maybe they should look at putting it in place, the Smith Falls project that you, you so effectively uh, participated in? How, how and what should they consider or what should they do to try and do some something oh, similar i would i would say to them just look over your shoulder at prince edward island prince edward island has been through resolutions in its legislature calling for a basic income now for over 15 years in the most recent election the liberal liberal premier was defeated after a period of 
substantial and constructive service. There's now a red Tory premier in a minority parliament. So the Greens are the official opposition. And they have had a special committee studying not only the causes of poverty, but the best possible ways to deal with it in PEI, just so we're clear. PEI, about 165,000 people live there. About 22,000 live beneath the poverty line, just so you have the numbers straight. And they have recommended, and in fact have formally asked Ottawa to partner with them for a basic income program in their province, which would replace welfare. And PEI would contribute the cost of welfare to the new federal partnership program, so they're doing their share. And then uh, all of the country could see how that works, what works well, what doesn't work well. And there's a complete multi-partisan commitment, left, right, center in PEI, farming community, the fishing community, and all the others, and the, and the business community, which is growing, that this would be a good way to go. I remember calling um, the for former conservative premier of, uh, of Newfoundland who had some difficulty with uh, Prime Minister Mulroney and uh, Danny, um, Danny just announced after he got his deal on the offshore and all of that, a massive increase in Newfoundland to welfare. I remember calling him when I'm saying, Premier, why, why would that be the first place you'd spend the money? And he said, Hugh, <clears throat> unlike um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper, I am a red Tory. And I believe that if government gets more income, they should give it to those who need it the most first. That's why we're going to have the highest rates of welfare in our province, but a basic income nationally would be far better. So there's already some understanding of this on yeah. the, in, the, in the Atlantic region, and I think it would be a very good place to start. Hugh, you've always argued that this is fundamentally a, a small C conservative idea, because for all those, particularly in the wake of the pandemic, who have felt there's way too much government in my life and way too much government in my face, this is actually dealing with that issue. Well, that's right. And um, I remember it was Milton Friedman, who has been a great promoter of this for many, many years, may he rest in peace. And he was from the Chicago School, a very right-wing monetarist economist. And he used to say, and I think our friends who are now upset about government would like this, he would say, if you gave the American government the Sahara Desert, <laughs> in three years, they'd have, a, they'd, have a, they'd, have a, they'd have a shortfall in sand. Don't give the money to government don't give it to bureaucrats give it to the low-income people themselves they will know how to spend it will there be a measure of abuse yeah there's abuse on every credit card in the country there's abuse on every card in the country will it be financially significant no will it liberate a population to make their own way with some measure of self-respect and esteem yes and will it strengthen the communities in which they live and the answer is yes and there's a whole bunch of people on the right who've been in favor of this, which gets some of my friends on the left anxious about it. They think there's some secret going on here. That's secret plan. Program. <laughs> but it's because we don't really want the state sitting down with poor people and finding out whether they have someone living with them or whether they uh, are eating too much meat. We don't want the state doing that. We want the state providing a basic amount as we do for seniors so they can get by and then let them make their own decisions in life and society. It produces a smaller state over time, in my judgment. Great to have you with us. And I too will call him Senator Siegel, uh, Greg, because uh, that's just one of so many titles that we could go through. But uh, reading Hugh's uh, written work on this as well, uh, Bootstraps Need boot, which, Boots, which seems pretty evident. It's hard to pull yourself up by them if you don't have any. Uh, so that's a really good point. And the Two Freedoms book, which, uh, which really looks at this issue from a more global perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, Hugh, just always appreciate your thoughts. One smart cookie. Thank you, Senator <laughs> Wallen. Thank you, Greg. Great privilege to be here. Thank you. Greg, a final comment? No, no, thank you very much. This is just excellent. And thank you for being so direct and forthright with us. Yeah. Very much appreciate sure. it. Again, a great example of how crunching data and, and blending it with a narrative makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, everybody who joined us again today. And we'll see you again soon for another edition of The Monthly. Bye bye for now. And that's why Government Analytics takes the time to crunch the numbers, to dig and discover the real story, the data story. Thank you for joining us. 
on the month. 